So let me now simply uh, give a bit word by way of introduction of myself before I sit down and simply to say that I'm a professor of practical theology and direct a PhD program in practical theology at St. Thomas University in Miami, Florida. But my distinguishing feature perhaps is that four years ago I had the joy and previously of being part of, of this faculty here at, at Dominican University and being inspired by my work with Janice and with so many of, of, of folk here at, at Dominican. And I've also always been inspired by the blues. And I've given scholarly presentations and work on the blues. But I've also been inspired by work such as James Cone's Spiritual, Spirituals in the Blues, as well as his most recent, The Lynching Tree. And I've always found that there is something tremendously powerful as a touchstone intellectually, personally, spiritually, and what we find in the blues. There is something there about event and experience that calls us back again and again to further reflection. There is also something there, and this is where I'll stop, in embodiment and emplacement. And it seems to me that we cannot dare to step on that sacred ground that is the blues and the struggle out of which it's born if we don't have that tremendous respect for the embodiment of those struggles, those experiences, those understandings from which the music and the culture is born, as well as the emplacement of it all. And so for me, I would suggest that when we look at this question of cultural tourism, the blues, it needs to be situated, and forgive me if I sound too much like a Baptist preacher here and giving you alliteration, in event, experience, embodiment, and emplacement. I'll stop with that and turn over to our three guests, please. Hi, um, hi everybody, my name is Dorothy Coyle. I worked for the city of Chicago um, since 1990. Uh, most recently, our work became part of a nonprofit organization called the Chicago Office of Tourism and Culture. Um, but basically, I've had the extremely good fortune of having a job where um, promoting blues as a, a, a tourism to the city has been part of my professional back in May of 1990. And um, really, you know, Chicago is a pioneer in the field of cultural tourism. I'm not sure if people always understand that. Um, Chicago is a city where the tourism office for the city became part of the cultural affairs department in the early 1990s. And that was before cultural tourism was even a buzzword in the travel industry. So there was no cultural tourism, so to speak, um, until a few years after um, you know, the industry started paying attention to what was going on in Chicago and really looking at cultural and heritage tourism as a niche that is um, extremely critical to the overall health of the travel industry. So um, the work that I've been involved in is really, as it relates to the blues, um, how to utilize the blues to market Chicago and also how to make um, blues as a form of Chicago culture as accessible as possible to the widest possible audience. And we've used a number of, um, you know, we've implemented a number of strategies to do that. I'll just mention a few. Um, and I've worked with Barry Dolan here for years. He's been my mentor and um, huge help in, in understanding the blues in Chicago and really learning about um, what are the major sites, you know, who, who are the great performers, and how can in such a way that will compel people to travel to the city. And it's how well-informed uh, international visitors are about blues in Chicago. They're extremely um, prepared when they come here. That is something that they absolutely want to consume. And we, um, you know, along the lines of, of trying to make it easier for people, in 2003, 
we had a program called um, Chicago Blues Exchange, where in, in celebration of the Year of Blues, which was designated by the U.S. Congress, we had uh, an exhibit at a venue downtown Chicago, 72 East Randolph Street, where we really traced the history of the blues in Chicago. And um, every Monday and Friday, I think we had performances, live performances by local blues artists. and really trying to you know, showcase uh, the story of the blues and then bring it to life with the performers. Because that's what, you know, the history is there, um, but the, the live music and performance is what really brings it to life for people. So um, from a marketing standpoint, I feel, um, you know, very lucky that we have we have the stories, we have the landmarks and the buildings that relate to blues, but we also have the live artists that can um, deliver the blues to our visitors every single day in Chicago. Um, in 2006, we launched an award-winning uh, podcast tour of Chicago blues, which was narrated by Buddy Guy and translated into four languages. Um, in the first year, it was downloaded from iTunes more than 250,000 times. Uh, the second most downloadable language after English was um, Chinese, Mandarin Chinese. So the tour was developed for people to actually go out and see the sites, you know, the historic landmarks, the clubs. Um, but what we found is that people were actually using this blues tour from wherever they were on their desktop, on their laptops, and learning about Chicago through this online blues resource, which is still um, available. And it has music clips and interviews with Chicago blues artists, et cetera. So that was um, a major you know, a tool that we developed that I think is still very um, valuable and, and, and being consumed. Uh, and then another uh, major, you know, looking at technology as a way to engage visitors and again, make it as accessible as possible. And all of these things have been free to the public. Um, in 2010, we launched a partnership with a company called Foursquare which is a geo-based um, social media um, company. So it's an application that you can, people can use on their mobile phones. So it's, it's uh, are people here familiar with Foursquare for the most part? Okay, so Chicago was the first city to partner with Foursquare to help um, engage visitors. And so our, our concept was we need to deliver the content um, the way people want it and where they are. So instead of just publishing brochure after brochure after brochure, we need to get it to people um, digitally where they are and, and really make it a game. And that's what Foursquare, um, the, the badge part does. There's a part where you check in and you can become mayor of a location, but we only have one mayor in Chicago. So, <laughs> um, so anyway, we introduced three badges that people could download. One was uh, Celery Salt, which is if you go to five hot dog locations in Chicago and you check in, you can get a Celery Salt badge. If there was one for movies, um, if you go to five film locations, you can get that badge. And then it, for blues, you can get a blues badge if you go to five landmarks and or blues clubs. And so we've had, um, since 2010, more than 20,000 check-ins at nine historic blues locations in Chicago. And we have 63,000 Foursquare followers, which is more than our Facebook fans and our Twitter followers combined. So Foursquare um, is a really important tool for us in terms of getting people moving around the city, uh, not just necessarily going to the same places that they always go, That tourists kind of fall into this, you know, it's great to be on Michigan Avenue, it's great to be in the loop, but where else, you know, can you go to experience what's authentically Chicago? And the blues are absolutely synonymous with Chicago. They are, you know, one in the same, and we want people to um, really feel like it's easy to explore and go out and enjoy the blues. Mississippi. Uh, I'm from Virginia, actually. 
But I, I moved to Mississippi in 1999. My name is Scott Beretta. I moved to Mississippi in 1999 to be the editor of Living Blues Magazine, which was founded here in Chicago in 1970, acquired by the University of Mississippi in 1983 uh, by the Center for the Study of uh, Southern Culture at the University of Mississippi, where I work there now teaching sociology and anthropology. But uh, so I came in 1999. Uh, shortly after we, I got there, uh, a, the release of a uh, study that had been authorized by the Clinton administration was released uh, on the viability of cultural tourism or blues tourism in uh, Mississippi. And it came back somewhat negatively that it's not going to revive the economy of the Delta, <laughs> which uh, wasn't really a big surprise. But uh, uh, we were disappointed by the way the in which the uh, study had been carried out, thinking that people didn't quite understand the nature of blues tourists. They're not your tourists who, uh, you know, go to the nice hotels and book package tours. They like to go drink beer, maybe in their car while they're driving around, find a, a juke joint. Well, that's uh, uh, our state habit of driving around drinking beer in the car. But uh, so any, in any case, what happened in the wake of the release of this report uh, was that a number of us who were involved in uh, blues in a, on a sort of a professional or quasi-professional level uh, formed an adjunct, uh, ad, ad hoc sort of a group uh, uh, to sort of study the viability of it. And we decided we wanted to look towards how we could do documentation of the blues, the creation of a map, and uh, uh, signage. Uh, that eventually uh, came to fruition with the uh, Mississippi Blues Trail, which uh, was launched in 2006. But the uh, Blues Trail uh, really only took off after a couple of other things happened. One was the uh, in 2003, uh, as you mentioned, it was the uh, Year of the Blues. Uh, that was initially passed by Congress, also designated uh, as such by the governor of Mississippi. And that was... I think the, the engine behind the Year of the Blues uh, it nominally was because it was 100 years after W.C. Handy experienced blues uh, in Tutwiler, saw a bluesman uh, playing in, at a train station in Tutwiler, Mississippi. But I think it was probably more of the marketing efforts of uh, Martin Scorsese, PBS, uh, Sony, and uh, BMG uh, for the, all the associated uh, uh, productions associated with uh, Martin Scorsese's film series. But in any case, what that did was really m made blues look important to certain people who didn't think it was important already, the business community, I think. Um, but that, so the governor formed a, a blues commission in Mississippi, but it didn't really do anything initially. What the real engine for the development of blues cultural tourism in Mississippi was, was the establishment of the B.B. King Museum in Indianola uh, around uh, 2004 or five. Uh, the city raised a million dollars and private funds towards the uh, creation of this museum. Uh, and eventually the museum, which opened, I think, in 2008 or 9, I can't recall now, uh, cost $15 million, most of which was privately raised funds. Uh, I was also involved with the B.B. Uh, King Museum. And one of the interesting things there was in creating a $15 million project, we had a lot of uh, uh, PR people, researchers, grant writers, experts, advisors, and all this. So that team uh, was, out of that team came this project to, let's put up a system of signs across Mississippi. Uh, initially, the idea was to put up 10 signs uh, in four neighboring counties in the Delta. You know, so it actually would be somewhat of a little trail you could follow through these four counties. Uh, and these are four counties uh, around Greenville, Clarksdale, uh, Cleveland, Mountain Bayou, um, you know, that uh, and, and those and sort of the north central uh, delta where there already was established blues tourism and, and festivals. Um, out of that, this, this ten, uh, series of 10 was launched in December of 2006. With the, with the first one was uh, Charlie Patton's uh, uh, burial place. Uh, Quickly, the uh, state decided to expand it to 120. Uh, just last week, we put up our 150-something marker. Um, and, and so it really has been a great success in, in Mississippi. It's been very much embraced by, uh, I guess, the government, the business community as, as a form of, of cultural tourism and economic development. Uh, you mentioned a minute ago that your, I think your cultural tourism was uh, a nonprofit organization. I guess ours is 
probably nonprofit since it's a government, but uh, the uh, Mississippi, it's run by the uh, Mississippi Development Authority, the Blues Trail. It is an economic development project, uh, which also has an uh, element of uh, uh, you know, cultural heritage, it's education. If you want to, uh, I don't have a display, but the front of the markers look like uh, regular historic markers, with about 50 words on them. Usually if you encounter these by the side of the road, it's the same text on both sides. Uh, by using this advanced technology called sticky vinyl, we're able to uh, <laughs> put uh, these big signs on the back. So we, these all contain about five or 600 words, images. Uh, so we're able to, you know, now through doing over, the these are, yes, yes. Her hometown, Mount Bayou. There, there is talk about putting one. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, they are. Initially, I said that they were just in the ten uh, counties. Uh, I mean, there were ten of them were in these four counties in the Delta, uh, and eventually, when the the state legislature jumped onto it, there was a decision made that at least fifty percent had to be outside of the Delta, so it wouldn't just be a little Delta political project. Um, another thing which happened uh, on the basis of the, the establishment of the uh, 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 the trail was that we got funding in the uh, by, from the NEH, federal NEA, the Mississippi Department of Transportation, which probably gets funding from the Department of Transportation, and that pays for half of the markers. The other half of the marker cost comes from the local community. So the state is essentially uh, trying to promote cultural tourism, but they're doing it with other people's money. So uh, this has been, I I'd say it's been a successful in, in economic terms because the state could never accused of this being any kind of a boondoggle because they simply aren't spending very much money on it and getting, getting an awful lot of uh, publicity uh, for it. The state does have uh, Alex Thomas, who's been at this conference once or twice, I believe, uh, Alex Thomas uh, is the director of it, and he works for the uh, tourism department. Um, and so we've put up over 150, uh, I don't know, how many, what, three years ago, four years ago, we put up one, three years ago, we put one up in uh, Grant Park, uh, where the Illinois Central train station used to be located at the very much of the south end. This is where Muddy Waters and all sorts of other people arrived uh, in Chicago. And we've, uh, this summer, we're placing one in Notod in uh, Norway, Dietrich Farr's old hometown. Um, <laughs> uh, but, and we've put them in Maine, Los Angeles, uh, Grafton, Wisconsin, where Paramount Records was located. Uh, but, um, you know, so what we've essentially done with, with the Blues Trail is to put into place a uh, infrastructure uh, which is meant to uh, attract blues tourists, you know, having them uh, by Going, having a bunch of places to visit, the idea is that they'll spend that many more days in Mississippi. Uh, by virtue of that, spend that much more on motel rooms, uh, meals, uh, tanks of gas. I, I don't like to think yeah. about it in the beer. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so there's been a lot more organization. I'd say about with cultural tourism, uh, Mississippi was very late in the game to uh, cultural tourism. As, as she mentioned, Chicago was a pioneer. Our two biggest cities are New Orleans and Memphis, <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, so we're in between two cities which, who, at least in the case of New Orleans, it, if you took away cultural tourism, there wouldn't hardly be an economy down there. Uh, Memphis, of course, has got the transportation hub, but also Beale Street and Graceland, two of the biggest uh, uh, tourist attractions in the country. So Mississippi is still in the process of developing uh, uh, this down in Jackson, uh, Mississippi, there's an ongoing uh, project to turn Ferris Street, uh, which was the, the main street for the African American community, into something akin to Beale Street, for better or worse. Uh, but so blues is being used in a number of ways as, uh, uh, you know, for purposes of economic development. And we can talk about the social issues uh, uh, and implications of that in a minute. I just wanted to say what, uh, what, what has actually gone on. Yes, I'm Barry Dolans, and um, I w retired from the mayor's office special events, uh, who I w used to work for since 1984, and um, came in and, and with an NEA grant to do a series of six mini blues festivals at the same time the city was preparing for uh, their initial 
festival in RV Field, Grand Park, although there was a festival in the south end of Grand Park back in 1969. Um, you know, prior to that, I uh, was a school teacher and taught um, adult ed at uh, Loyola, a blues course called Chicago Blues and Urban Experience. And to me, um, certainly, I want to commend the efforts of uh, certainly the city of Chicago and Dorothy and and Scott and Alex Thomas with the state of Mississippi of really bringing cultural tourism to the forefront and utilizing blues uh, so uh, instrumentally uh, in trying to uh, captivate the public and uh, introduce many to uh, such a significant art form. But uh, in reality, uh, certainly, um, you know, blues and cultural tourism goes uh, a little bit, little bit earlier. I don't want to say it, it, it brought certainly brought uh, African Americans up uh, to Chicago, but um, it also introduced um, many uh, performers back in the 60s uh, to Chicago blues. Um, let it be, uh, you know, certainly Irwin Halford driving Charlie Musselwhite to the west side, and um, Bob Kester bringing a lot of uh, blues fans to uh, clubs on the west and south side. I personally brought busloads. Uh, you know, to me, I thought uh, blues had the power of volunteer busing, of uh, bringing um, uh, fans and uh, people that wanted to know more about it uh, to um, Teresa's and the checkerboard on 43rd Street was uh, really my office before I started working for the city. And um, so, um, but in today's uh, world, certainly, this has to be uh, codified and quantified and qualified as cultural tourism. And what this all means, certainly in a day when we're trying to create experience economy uh, and really creating a stimulating uh, attraction uh, where people are no longer just selling goods and services, but they have to be selling these experiences. Uh, you know, blue certainly plays an important role in this. and. Um, the whole idea of it within our economy is they're the creative arts industry, and therefore supporting the blues men and women is important, as well as you know providing uh, an opportunity for businesses to, to develop as a uh, auxiliary form of uh, of um, making the blues uh, an industry that we all want to uh, see brought up uh, a notch or two. Um, so I think in the sense that, you know, cult, you know, cultural tourism is really dealing with certainly people's lifestyles and, um, you know, in doing so and promoting uh, cultural t tourism, you're promoting festivals and rituals, um, and thus we're trying to create, well, what is the authenticity experience that people need to really uh, be part of? And uh, I think that authenticity question has been one underlying or above board on this particular uh, symposium, but also is something that uh, um, is underlying in everybody's, you know, let it be journalists from uh, across the country to academics across the country, that well, what is the authenticity, not only certainly uh, for any experience, but particularly for that blues experience. I mean, there's been a book uh, written about uh, authenticity within Chicago blues and you know, let it be uh, the North Side clubs or, or the festival itself. I mean, certainly, um, you know, to me, if that experience is happening, it's as authentic as it's going to get for the, the, that time and being. You're not going to necessarily recreate, you know, 1956 uh, performance of Juke or actually the test marketing of Juke outside uh, the, uh, the, the chess studios at the, the chess actually not even a studio, just his, his, uh, his office at 48th and Cottage, test marketing that, and by playing a speaker to a bus stop and seeing if people would be, uh, have some impact and be stimulated by juke, you know, and that was, you know, that was basically, and that's where marketing, again, you know, we talk about what well, everybody needs marketing, well, I mean, blues marketing has really been at the grassroots, so I think blues experience has always been at the grassroots, and, um, to really have this idea of cultural tourism in the blues, as you see, it's been always been part of it, you know, it, and people want to experience it and let it be at the grassroots of the musicians themselves where musicians from all over the world have come to Chicago 
really to be part of the community and trying to figure out then, well, in tourism, well, who is that gatekeeper? You know, let it be now we have, the, you know, the excitement of being online as that gatekeeper. People trying to figure out, well, where are these landmarks uh, in Chicago Blues history or the landmarks in uh, the state of Mississippi? Uh, it's all online now. So the gatekeeper no longer is the Irwin Helfers or the Bob Kesters or to try to bring people to uh, Silvio's on the west side. But, you know, it's, it's the public sector's role now to help and support um, the blues community and uh, cultural tourism within the blues or blues within cultural tourism. Thank you very much. Thank you.